Our next speaker will tell us more about some of what's happening here. He's a genomic scientist and a pioneer in synthetic bio biology. He's also the founding director and CEO of the Pink Army Cooperative, the world's first open source biotechnology company uh, that is working to make personalized affordable medicines for breast cancer. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please warm welcome for Andrew Hessel. Hello, Stockholm. <laughs> it's so good to see you again and to have you listen to another story. Um, DNA is my life, and this is one of the most interesting areas of DNA. We're going to, today, I'm going to talk to you about love in the age of DNA. It's been popping up on my radar screen more and more because genetics is getting really, really, really personal. And I think it's time we start paying attention to some of this. So, a little bit about me. Uh, I, I'm co-chair of bioinformatics and biotechnology at the Singularity University, which is a really fun little university where we try and crack people's heads open, show them, teach them about fast-changing technologies, have them look a little bit out into the future of where these technologies are going to be, and start thinking about how we're going to use them. Technologies tend to get faster, better, cheaper, more, compli more complicated, more social. And so we, we have to teach these technologies in different ways than we've taught courses in the past. The paradigm is usually just electronic computing. Digitization, we're familiar with. Computing gets more powerful about every 18 to 24 months. But I sit at this wonderful intersection of computing, which is moving really quickly, and biology genetics, which is changing actually at about a rate of 10 times per year now for some, for some uh, aspects of it. Now, love and technology, hmm. Uh, it turns out that actually love um, is usually at the forefront of a lot of different technologies. If you go way back, here's a lovely picture of a woman having an interesting Friday night. Um, but. It's, what's interesting here is that she's actually drinking alcohol. Biotechnology was one of the first technologies that humans uh, got really good at, and it certainly made um, some of our evenings more interesting, <laughs> even to this day. Now, not to leave out the sciences, Leonardo really liked taking a look at some of these technologies as well and made some fantastic uh, you know, medical illustrations of related to love and reproduction. The arts picked up on it, Painting got fairly realistic quickly. Photography, when it came along, immediately started moving into examining how, let's just say, capitalizing on this new technology. Same with motion picture, film. Film stayed pretty much at the forefront of a lot of this until the VCR. Most of you probably don't remember when it came out. But it's computers that really started to wake, to really drive a lot of this forward. We all know what built the internet. It's moving into mobile. This was a, in doing research for this talk, I found a really interesting statistic. 26, no, sorry, one third, 33% of girls under 26 text, message, nude pictures or semi-nude pictures of themselves to partners. Remember, there's no security on the web. Actually, 11% were in the 13 to 16 age bracket. This is really fascinating. This is completely different. Our, our privacy and our idea of privacy is kind of eroding. Shifting to a different technology, we know that chemistry was really at the forefront of some of this too with the pill. This is a massive change in how we actually related to love and sex. And then there's the male pill. I worked in the biopharmaceutical industry, and I remember in 1995, they were asking us, go and make the next blockbuster drug. And I said, mm, look, you know, we're working, we're working to make drugs for people that are sick. Why don't we make something that just makes people feel really good? And I mentioned something like this, and I was laughed out of the room. Two years later, when Pfizer released this, it changed the pharmaceutical industry. 
It peaked at over $2 billion worth of sales just a couple of years ago, and now there's competitors and clones and even natural uh, substitutes that are encroaching on that market. Functional MRI, this is brain scanning. No sooner was this technology made that we started to put people into it and explore what happens to the brain in terms of attraction and orgasm. Interesting studies. Back surgeries. In, in, there's this one surgery where you can put electrodes in the back to alleviate pain. Um, what this one doctor found, Dr. Malloy, was that put the electrodes in the right place and you actually stimulate orgasm. It's literally an orgasmatron. I don't have one installed, but maybe I will. Of course, this has already been brought to market in a different technology. Uh, this is... Uh, you, you know what it is. But it, what's interesting is that it actually hooks up to your iPad. And in fact, there's a field of study now that actually is building internet-connected mm, stimulation devices for men and women, and it's a growing market. This is telepresence. It's teledildonics. So the robotics end is actually moving extremely quickly. This is a tennis playing, you know, ping pong playing robot. Why do you think they made it look this way? <laughs> it's because it gets more attention. Sex really does sell. So even in robotics, people are paying attention to this. And this is a robot made by a company called Boston Dynamics, and I really like this robot. This, is one of the, this was just released about a week, a, a month ago. It's called Petman. So this is one of the best bipedal robots that there is out there. And you can just see him walking off down to the corner. So, oh, he gets pushed by some <laughs> mean guy. But it just keeps on going. What I like about this, it was actually developed with military technology, so here it just surrenders. <laughs> 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 Don't shoot! <laughs> but, and then it's learning how to do a little bit of mobility, but it's, it's the next move I want you to see because I think it's, it kind of shows where some of this stuff goes when he stands up. Because here, he's actually learning to fall in love and proposes. That's really cute. Anyways, and then he's off to the gym. So where robotics goes in this area is, we don't know, but people will build some really interesting robots just because of our need to have physical attention and contact. And this gets actually harder as you get older. I don't know what this, this model will be available, but... To move into my own field, though, genetics is really at the core of who we are. It's, it's our operating system. It's, it's, it's our program. And we're constantly writing new programs. And we're open source. Our DNA is really easy to recover. I've been working with DNA since about 1985. And I started working with these little guys. These are bacteria. They're really the, the organisms that run our lives because we're just containers to move the bacteria around. But I became really fascinated with these little things, and I used to breed them. You can breed them. They have sex. And the wonderful people would ask me, do you have kids? And I'd go, oh, trillions. Because these little things grow like crazy. But what I really loved about these was that if you split them open, press them, like squishing them like a tube of toothpaste, their genomes come out. And I realized that this is the program. And I wanted to study this program, and it just it hooked me for life. In higher cells, this is plant cells, it's a little more complicated. You can see kind of these chromosomal structures. But when you get down to it, it's just code. It's just data. And we're getting really, really good at reading this data now. This is a, this is a modern bank of, of automated DNA sequencers. We're so good at this, it costs about a millionth of a cent to sequence a base of DNA. It costs more to store it on a computer system. So we just have banks and banks of these machines sequencing the world now. And in fact, it's come down to desktop levels. This is a little desktop sequencer made by a company called Ion Torrent. And I've already seen equipment that will bring it down to a cell phone. So this is, they're starting to make these little chip-based sequencers. And as these gets better, you'll be able to actually sequence different things in the environment. So we're able to read and do some analysis of genetic material pretty much all around us these days. 
you can, always get, you can already get little kits to go and sequence. So this really starts to change the game when it comes to, when it comes to our lives. So I started looking at, well, how could people play with some of this stuff? What would they be interested in? And it turns out when it comes to our relationships, one of the things that we think about a lot is who's sleeping with who? Is our partner cheating? And it turns out you can buy these kits online that actually allow you to go and test your partner's underwear to see if there's evidence of DNA. Now, this isn't sequencing it. This is just looking for ejaculates and, and various other fluids. But it's right out of CSI, if you watch that show. The next generation of this stuff won't just analyze DNA, the presence or absence of, it'll tell you who it is. <laughs> Literally, you'll be able to go and get the barcode and go, and it'll probably be linked to their Facebook profile. <laughs> That'll be really interesting. What are you doing with my husband? What are you doing with my wife? <laughs> this is a little scary. <laughs> Who's your daddy? Now, we've had lots of different ways to understand kids. One of the easiest ones is just blood types. And if you worked at a hospital, you know, in, in the maternity ward, you realize sometimes the blood types don't match up but it's getting a lot more sophisticated. Here's, a, here's an article I tracked down where an anonymous sperm donor was traced by his son. The son was 15. <laughs> and just using a few bits of information about himself and from the web, he actually went and found his anonymous dad. I thought that was kind of cool. Then there was, mm, let's just say, these, these sperm banks that were, that were being a little cheap, and they were going back to the same donor and getting multiple samples. And in a small community, that, turned, that sometimes produces some weird effects, like literally having hundreds of stepbrothers and sisters in a small community. This is really strange. But people have actually formed, gone out and traced all their stepbrothers and sisters and started having some really odd family reunions. <laughs> Remember, we're all related. We're all related. So it's just a matter of how many degrees of separation. And then there's these kits. This is literally from the website. Uh, home paternity testing system. You want to you know who your dad is? <laughs> you want to confirm it? This is, we generally know who the mothers are, by the way. <laughs> if you don't, if you don't you're, you should, you're in trouble. But this is literally, this is so you can actually confirm whether your father is who you think it is. And they sell a lot of these kits. They're getting more and more secret, more and more sophisticated. But sometimes, and this comes out already in genetic screening today, you find out some darker secrets. You find out this is, this is a, 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 in, in the analysis of some genetic defects, they found, oh, there's evidence of incest in the family. And this comes out just with, with standard testing. We broadcast our genetic information everywhere we go. It, and, it, and we can look deeper and deeper into this information every day. Mate selection. We don't think about this too much, but nature does. Think about the peacock. The male invests a tremendous amount of energy to make sure that it looks attractive for the female. In human society, we don't worry about it that much. You know, we look for things like senses of humor, etc. But there's some groups that are starting to, to actually make tests so that you find a genetically compatible partner. And this is using things like mm, some of the literature for, for immunological matching people with different immune systems tend to like each other more, and there's some good genetic reasons for that. And this group will go and actually run some tests and partner you up with people that they feel uh, are good matches. Now, this isn't very sophisticated yet, but it's going to get there. 
23andMe is a company, I don't know if any of you have used the service, I don't know how popular it is in Europe, but it's quite popular in the US, and they probably have somewhere over a quarter million customers now. But this is, for $99, you can get over eight, um, about a million different parts of your genome analyzed. And now they can screen for hundreds and hundreds of different genetic features and medical conditions. The thing that I find interesting is that they do tend to focus this on health and, and disease. And it would be a little odd if they started asking deep questions about your sexuality or who you wanted to go out with on a Friday night. On the other hand, there's a website called OkCupid. It's an open source dating site. People reveal all sorts of stuff about their relationships there. All crazy stuff. And they do a lot of data mining on the information that people publish. And I swear, you put a $99 gene test on top of OkCupid, and you've got a pretty interesting database. Can you find genetic markers for a sense of humor? Can you do predictions of what your kids are going to look like? Can you find a good match in the same way that Gene Partners does it, but now for a much lower price? And, across, and search across a population, so you can actually go and look for different features. You want a tall child? You want blue eyes? Maybe that'll become a factor in your dating decisions. Already, there's groups that are putting this out, being able to look for STDs using a simple test and analyzed by your cell phone. <laughs> this is pretty wild. You know, you're in a bar, you meet someone nice. You, you, want, you want to know <laughs> as soon as possible before you go one, one step further. This is one of the biggest drivers for genetic testing. It's affecting the way we love and have relationships. And if we're getting more serious and we actually do want to have children, maybe we should go and get analyzed before we do. And there are a few tests that have really um, made a big difference in, in preventing mm, certain, certain genetic anomalies. This group um, was created by a fellow that uh, was literally blindsided. He found that his young daughter had a very rare genetic disease he had never heard of before and then he subsequently had to go and deal with it. And then he went to some other doctors and said, can we build a test to look for all rare genetic diseases? So that, so that when potential parents come together, they can get risk profiles for all of them with a single test. So this is, you do this enough, if you screen for it enough, essentially you end up preventing these types of, of mutations from ever happening. So this is moving forward. And unlike um, some people that you might find on a dating site in their profiles, DNA doesn't lie. They don't take pictures of themselves beside a Porsche and go, <laughs> this is my car, and really they're just at an automobile dealership. You know, you can, you can actually tell a lot about people's personalities, about their traits from DNA. It doesn't always tell the whole truth, but it's hard to hide from your DNA. And then there's the actual babies themselves. We've tested, we've done this type of test on babies for decades, where we just do a little heel prick, we get some blood, and we test for a few inborn errors of metabolism. This is getting more sophisticated. We've also looked for Down syndrome. Today we can identify this very early, and most people choose to abort. Something like 92%, rather than, so the number of Down's children are, are dropping off. We sex select. You know, it's well known that there are hundreds of millions of missing female babies in China because of, because of the desire to have male babies. So we're starting to run up to the question, how much testing should we do to our children? What, you know, and we can do this earlier and earlier in, in the pregnancy procedures. When do you, when do you decide What's right? What's wrong? We're having to face this, and particularly in socialized healthcare systems where you make centralized decisions about what to fund and where there's downstream consequences for society and supporting. This is becoming a bigger and bigger question.
And we're moving to an age where you may end up getting birth control pills that actually control your birth. What if you took a pill and you knew you were going to get a boy or a girl or, or different features? Fascinating stuff, and it's happening right here, right now, almost in real time. Then recently I noticed that we can take any cell in your body now, any cell that we get that's living, turn it into a stem cell, which can become any other cell in your body with more manipulations, which opens up some really fascinating possibilities that someone will come along one day, if you're famous perhaps, and take a glass from the restaurant that you just ate at, swab it and get a few live cells from your lips, take those to the lab, turn them into stem cells, and then differentiate them into sperm, and then go have your baby without you knowing it. This can be done. <laughs> Even if you just make it into sperm and put it on the dress, it'll make fun for your lawyers. <laughs> Biopaparazzi are coming. They are. But what I really wanted to talk to you about was what's really getting interesting on the forefront of this. What I've told you about is the reading of DNA and kind of some of the manipulations around the comprehension of it, but it's the writing of DNA that really fascinates me. Writing DNA is where you choose to make different things. This is the field called synthetic biology. And synthetic biology is just genetic engineering done with computer-aided tools and a printer that makes DNA. If you can type, you can be a genetic engineer today. And this is usually what I talk about. You type something, you send it away to a print shop, you get something like this back, a little bit of DNA in a tube. Bits to atoms, and now you can boot that DNA in biology. The biotech industry's actually done some products that we use every day. Um, to look more attractive. Botox sells a lot of these vials. So this is one of the first uses of biotech directly related to love. It's moving into other organisms. This is just yeast cells. You can put almost anything in a yeast. Most people don't run biotech shops out of their house, but you do make bread and we do make beer really easily. So you're going to see a lot of new compounds coming out into yeast, because this is the distribution system. And recently, the chocolate genome has been published as well, so chocolate's always had a particular close relationship with love, and soon it could get pharmacologically more interesting. This fellow's name is Tony Atala. Earlier this year, he showed how there's new printers coming out that are getting very good at printing different cellular structures. They're called bioprinters, and one day they hope to be able to grow you, print you a new heart, or a new pair of lungs, or in this case, a kidney. But already people are thinking, hmm, if that's the case, maybe I want a tail. Or maybe just <coughs> not silicon. Here's silicone. This is... If you make your own tissues with your own cells, you don't reject. It becomes a new part of you. Print-on-demand tissues is fascinating. I wonder what men will do with it. <laughs> it goes deeper than that. So much of our attraction to others is actually at a low level. It's actually smell. I guarantee you, you like the smell of your partner. What if you start reprogramming that? We've always had these perfumes that said that they have pheromones in it. We're actually getting really good at making some of those with these technologies. Because after all, sex really is in the brain. Attraction is in the brain. And neurobiology is one of the areas where we're starting to manipulate more and more. I, I see this as just being a massive market, being able to shape people's interests and loves, not just in other people, but in other things. I've joked about one day walking into a store and feeling the need to go buy things because they're actually manipulating your brain with, with compounds that are odorless and 
undetectable otherwise, but just makes you feel really good when you're in the store. And then there's aging. This is Cynthia Kenyon, and she focuses most of her work on stopping aging. And of course, that is a big part. Looking attractive, feeling attractive is such a big part of our relationships. Is it something that you care about as you get older? Many people do. This is Louise Brown and Robert Edwards. Robert Edwards won a Nobel Prize in medicine in 2010. Louise Brown is the first test tube baby. I remember this in 1978. So, what was done here was was literally an egg was implanted into. Uh, into a host mother, and she was born. Her son was, was, was uh, conceived naturally. The really interesting thing to me about synthetic biology is that we're getting really good at writing genomes. We write small genomes now, viruses, bacteria, but we're moving up the tree of life, the complexity of genomes, every time our printers get better. And you can already draw points on a graph and it's pretty clear that in the, between the next 10 and 20 years, we should be able to make human-scale genomes. That gets a little interesting, because when you can make our 23 chromosomes, and the machinery is all there in every one of our cells, then you get the possibility of doing nuclear transplants, and with IVF, booting babies. Synthetic babies, wow. We're going to have to change some of our thinking about relationships, about kids, about what we want, because this is coming pretty fast. And as I was saying in another meeting last week, if we have this technology, that makes things like cloning seem almost organic. That makes the idea of, of having children the way we do today, even with all the screening, seem quaint. And it makes the idea of having, conceiving children without any screening mm, probably borderline illegal because it could potentially harm the baby or the mother. I don't know where these transition points are, but I know it's affecting us more and more every day as we go forward. And not just maybe twins, but these are actually identical quadruplets, beautiful young girls. No, no drugs. This was not fertility drugs. This was just one of the rare natural cases where it happened. There's only something like less than 50 cases of identical quadruplets ever in the world. Fascinating. But we could literally do production lines like this. And the funny thing is, you know, so much of our intentions are set by playing with these ideas and in, a, in, in entertainment. And Avatar was a movie that a lot of people saw um, last time I checked. Something like 300 million people saw the movie globally, which isn't all that many, but a lot of kids I know are, will grow up with watching this movie again and again and be thinking about this as they go into their later schooling and careers. And the idea of growing synthetic bodies brain-machine interfaces, and ultimately falling in love with alien species is just what they consider normal, or what they want to do in grad school. So I think the relationship between love, sex, DNA, is going to get a lot more complex. We should be aware of it, we shouldn't be afraid of it, but we should be thinking of where we want it to go. Mm, thank you.